Hi everybody, uh, I'm George, I'm from UK on the Head of Communications here uh, and we're here with another session. Uh, this time we're going to be talking about intellectual property. You know, it might not be the topic that you think is the most exciting thing in the world, but we've got a man here who's going to prove you wrong. He's going to prove you very wrong indeed and he's going to talk about a lot of the challenges that people are facing in the new world of IP in terms of video games and the way they're changing, but also some COVID specific challenges. So we're joined by Mo from the UK team. Mo, hello. Hi George, how are you? I'm not too bad, thank you very much. And yourself? Yep, hanging in there, hanging in there. Hanging in there. So, you know, people might not be aware of the work that you do for UK at the moment. So do you want to just give us a quick lowdown about what kind of stuff you get up to on behalf of the UK team, specifically in relation to IP? Yeah, sure. And thanks for the intro. Like you say, when people hear the words intellectual property, they get scared, they get bored, um, and they probably want to get locked up at home and not <laughs> actually deal with it. But we are at home. And you can't escape it. So um, what we try to do and, and what I cover is where intellectual property is being taken and quite frankly stolen. Uh, let's be honest, we all worked hard whether directly or indirectly helping IP grow. Without IP, there would be no games, there would be no game sector and the likes of us and many others wouldn't have a job to do. So it's very important that we try to protect it. Yes, you will always hear about it's not fair, People are making lots of money out of it and what's wrong with it. But, um, you know, my thing is we all want to work hard for our living and livelihood, et cetera. And in this current climate, that's more apparent. So the fact that people are going out there and profiting from it, and that's what it is, and I'll explain that, um, you know, it's wrong. So uh, as the, uh, you know, as the trade body for the um, games industry, we help our members protect their IP. So obviously we have our partner members who will help before the, the project has started and making sure that people and companies um, trademark or think about copyright or put the right agreements in place. So for example, if you are using a, you know, a, a music composer, making sure there's a, there's a contract in place because what you don't want is the game becomes successful, suddenly that composer or he's setting up a, a Twitch or a YouTube video where he's generating or he or she's generating traffic potentially you know taking um, revenue and traffic away from anything that you've recorded but once the actual game um, is made basically it's out there to be copied um, whether it be a small indie mobile app all the way to you know your your triple way kind of game people will be out there trying to make money from it now in my days when i was growing up um, we would probably, I'm not saying it was me, but let's just say people would go to the likes of Boots and buy a cassette and um, go home, copy it, and then, you know, probably give it back. Now, obviously, in this day and age, um, with technical uh, protection measures in place, which are known as TPMs, it's a little bit more complicated to copy a game. And that's especially apparent on, you know, the, the latest generation of consoles. Yes, it's still, you know, pretty much... Um, inevitable that a PC game will be cracked and loads of people may want to play those games. Some of them get put off because, again, it's not as easy as it used to be. And if anything, that's a, a technical barrier and a challenge that most novices don't want to you know, go through. With regards to the console environment, as I say, you know, there are some of the consoles that you can play. But unfortunately, or shall I say fortunately, um, for the, the owners, you can't play online and that obviously puts a lot of people off so you may be able to you know do certain things to your console which allow you to play you know games for free but you won't be able to play online with your friends and family and again in this current climate that will put a lot of people off so that's the kind of traditional if you want to call it piracy that bad word that we see where people are actually taking the game content and making it available and as i say that can be from an indie game all the way to the biggest block Stuff. So why do they do it? Now, what I tell the members is, first of all, you've 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 put a lot of time and effort making that game, and you know you're not trying to become you know a multimillionaire, but obviously you've put your hard graft into it, and you want to make sure it's successful and people enjoy it. And you probably want to do a follow up or make another game. Well, the only way you're going to get money to make that second title is if people pay for it, and that revenue comes in, and that allows you to then go on to other projects. That's like with any business. Now, the people who make these games available, they make money in two ways, either by advertising. So when you go to these websites and you see those annoying pop ups about um, usually um, 
adult dating sites and there are all these people who are available in your local area but always seem to be in sunny climates and I can tell you that's nothing like where I live at the moment um, but the other way is um, through actually the downloads every time you download they get a kickback and the best way to explain it is Mega Upload, the, the famous site that was around probably, I think, nearly 10 years ago now, where the owner of the site, the whole um, FBI SWAT team, swarmed to his lovely mansion in New Zealand, um, which was, I think, the, uh, the most expensive house in New Zealand at the time, and uh, basically took the guy down. Now, the way a lot of these sites, uh, Mega Upload, we call them cyber lockers, um, the way they work is, you know, for example, I have a cracked version of a game, I upload it onto their servers, and then every time George and his friends download it, I essentially get a kickback. So the more people download the game, the bigger kickback that I get. So when you go to these sites, they may claim to be free, and they may say that, well, you can have this game and you don't have to pay anything, but they're profiting from it, either directly through the cyber lockers giving them a payment or indirectly through the advertising. Now, that's all fine and dandy for them, but again, none of that revenue is going back to the game publisher. And, and in a way, I don't like sometimes hearing in our tech environment, well, you know, we're techies, we should be used to it, they should be doing better. But at the end of the day, everyone, everyone works to earn money and everyone works to make sure that they can move on to bigger and better things, really. So that's kind of the primary area that we focus on in protecting our members' IP. And that's the service that we provide to our members for free. Um, so if you join as a member, we can make sure that we're protecting your IP and taking down these links. Um, how that helps us is that uh, my side will go into well, This is it. I mean, you know, I think I think it's important to, to mention about how much Mo's truthing on, both with the addition yeah. of a sun in the background, but also clearly some work being done next door um, in the next door garden, possibly by some of these people who you've been taking down over the years. Maybe this is their revenge for you, is uh, yeah. to make sure that they're making a lot of noise in the background. But um, I mean, so you know, you've given a really good summary there of a lot of the kind of like key intellectual property challenges facing out there. And you see, that, that, this is it. This is why, incidentally, this is one of the sh small benefits of lockdown has just been the absolute joy that little moments like this, like little sort of slight bits of chaos that they all bring in. Um, but so one of the things that you were talking about there was about new challenges when it comes to intellectual property. Um, you know, because, you know, back in the day, like you say, it used to be, can you go and rip something onto a tape or can you find a way to make some bootleg copies of games? It used to be sort of very much more old fashioned police going to places, kicking in doors and finding all of these games lying around there. Whereas nowadays, you know, a lot of our members, a lot of people watching this stream who will be making games. They might be releasing their games on Steam for cost. They could be releasing a free game where they're hoping to monetize through advertising. They might be releasing a free game and hoping to monetize through in-game purchasing. You know, what, what kind of challenges does that present in terms of intellectual property? And, and, and in, in specifically in relation to what happens if these games are getting ripped off and these companies are too? Yeah, sure. And um, hopefully the interruptions have stopped for now. So, um, but yeah, so that's exactly what we're seeing in that there are games where, okay, it's not worth people actually thinking, well, let's just crack the game and post it online. If anything, we have a new type of criminal, and that's what they are, because it is fair. They're saying, OK, let's set up a, a, a Steam account using stolen credit card details often, and let's purchase these games because they're appearing in the, you know, the Steam charts, they're popular. And then let's go on to a marketplace like eBay, and let's give people access to that game. So, you know, to buy to purchase the game could be you know anything from 20 pounds to 40 pounds and they'll sell you access for a few pounds so to most people it's a no-brainer again you know that's um you know false revenue and potentially revenue that's being lost because you know the 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 actual buyer sorry the actual buyer the game player is not buying the game and they may not be able to benefit from buying any in-game items etc so and that's another area as well in-game items you know obviously a lot of games are free to play and they make their, um, you know, the commercial uh, element lies in the in-game element of their game. So what we're seeing is, um, you know, loads of standalone sites that are actually allowing people to get the, um, the pieces of content at usually a cheaper price than if you went to the official platform to purchase it. Also, um, that's usually the case uh, with all games. And then specifically in the mobile platform, you have what are known as mod versions of games. And this is where essentially they get rid of the whole element of buying anything. So you get all your power ups, all your items, all your gold, et cetera, for free. Now, many would argue that takes the fun out of the game 
But to some people in the current climate, well, I'm, I'm bored, I get this game, and I just want to get through it as quickly as possible. So again, it's, it's that loss of revenue. And usually when I give a presentation, um, I, I start off with, yes, there is the traditional piracy. And I'm sure most people have heard or read about, especially in this current climate, the, the level of piracy has increased when it comes to audiovisual content. So a lot of the film studios, TV um, studios are complaining that the, the traffic increase into these types of sites. Well, um, just to, on a side note, we haven't seen a major increase to the to the game download slash torrent sites because games come out, they take a long time to play, etc. But what we are seeing is an increase to the sites that are selling the counts, you know, that are selling in-game items, etc. So whether it be a marketplace platforms or standalone sites, that's where we're seeing the increase because again, someone can pay 30, 40 pound and get access to potentially 10 games, which would you know, potentially cost 10 times more, that, more than that if they actually bought those games. So yes, that's where we're seeing the, the commercial criminal, if you want to call it. You know, again, to go back to that old scenario, most of the times when games are cracked, it's done for fun. It's that technical challenge, ha ha ha, we beat you. Whereas a new kind of criminal is basically saying, well, I can actually make money from this. And we're even also seeing, going back to the old days of physical merchandise. So there's lots of print on demand sites that are actually making COVID related t-shirts say, you know, stay at home and then it will have a character from a game, etc. So, yeah. you know, trying to monetize on that. So again, it's purely done from a financial um, outlay and reason. And really what we can do is identify those type of infringements. And again, where these are big platforms and therefore there are policies in place that allow us to report either for a copyright or trademark infringement. So that's the good news, yeah. you know, you know, it may be out there, but we can help. Yeah, exactly. And I think as well, there's there's the sort of another effect, which can be the, kind of like the reputation of the industry too. You know, you talked about in-game currency and one of the problems, you know, you, you've been aware of and we've all been aware of are things like illegal skin betting sites where, you know, people are taking currencies or skins or um, other in-game items and using them to, to wager to a certain cash value. And, you know, I know that some people might look at that and go, well, what's the harm in that? You know, they're in-game items, surely, well, they've got an equivalent value or whatever, surely it's all fine. But, you know, we see, you know, I see it in my job, you know, people like in the media don't realise those sites aren't allowed and they see those sites existing and they see people going on there and betting in a way that isn't fitting at all with games. And they start going, well, hang on a minute, oh, games are gambling, aren't they? And it's like, no, that's, that's a completely different thing. And it's all about the fact that intellectual property there hasn't been potentially respected and that people are starting to use it in ways that they're not allowed to. Um, that that also has a hit, not just on the revenue that a company is making, but also potentially on its reputation and the reputation of the industry as a whole. So it's important we take this seriously. But when it comes to challenges like this, you know, what are the kinds of things I guess there's two levels of it. You know, there are the services we can offer, uh, which I'm, I'm sure you're going to come to in a moment in, in relation to tackling that. But to, before you go into what are the services we can offer to deal with that, what are your kind of top tips for developers to try and stop as much of this problem at source? You know, what can they do from the outset to try and prevent these problems, um, or at least to give themselves the best possible foundation to, to fight back against them? Yeah, sure. And it's kind of something that you touched upon at the beginning where you mentioned that when companies put stuff out for free or they market their game content. And that's what I recommend. You know, I hate to say, if you can't beat them, join them and buy that, get the content out there, make sure you're in control. Don't let the bad guys make the decisions for you. So making sure that you have a, you know, what I call a release schedule in place. So when a game is gonna go out, if it goes to any journalist, make sure that there are embargoes in place so you know you know when content is going to be made available tell them what content to make available obviously don't give any spoilers away etc obviously monitor and filter that and make sure that it's reputable sources when we have dealt with game leaks in the past it's usually been a journalist who's been able to get onto a list and probably it's the first time they've been on that list and let's just say they're not on that list again um, once the game has been released expect it to be out there you can't control it but obviously you know we will do our best to make sure that you know we will remove as much content as possible and i'll come on to that a little bit later um, then it's again it's a case of making sure that any updates or anything like that that you're that are going out there let us know or make sure they scheduled at the right time so for example if you know 
there's going to be an interest in the game for a particular reason. If, for example, I'm just going to go with um, a small team game, for example, um, just make sure that that update is done at the right time. Um, obviously, copy, I'm sorry, trademark as much as possible. There is a cost for that, but obviously in the long run, there are benefits to that because it makes it easier, whether it be us or your law firm, to take action on your behalf. If you don't own the trademark, especially in the, the mobile platform, it's very difficult to get the likes of Google or Apple to take action. They will not take action. Um, likewise, with copyright, make sure that you're aware. Try to make things as unique as possible. Obviously, that makes it easier again. So again, to, um, to say, to, to mention about the mobile platform, we see and our members contact us where games are copying. So they are essentially copy, copying content from a game and it looks very similar. So if it's very unique, if it's, you know, if it's someone called George Osborne, that's not going to get you anywhere. As we know, you know, no, there's exactly. many, many. Two, two, lots of George Osborne's out there. That's what yeah, I think. And, 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 and I hear the same about Mo Ali. So it's a great, you know, alias to use if you don't want people to Google you. So, um, but yeah, um, go to side, you know, if something is unique, it's a lot more easier. And, you know, we are working with a few of our members where we are taking down T-shirts with, again, you know, characters, um, you know, icons, etc., which are unique to that game. So it's very easy to file a copyright notice and get that content taken down. Obviously, keep an inventory of it as well, because, you know, usually when we're asked, why are you asking, you know, us to take this down, we need to provide an example. So ideally, if there is an original copy of something, whether it be a, a link to the website, that's perfect for us as well. In the long run, it helps it. You do the legwork now, it pays off in the long run. Yeah, exactly. So it's, a, it's, a, it's about erecting those defences as best as you can. You know, take take that opportunity, you know, um, whether it's with us or, you know, quite a lot of our legal members as well. It's worth checking out uh, things like the UK YouTube channel and our blog because we know that we've had legal members before give advice about trademark and um, trademarks and other elements and copyright and things like that. So you can tell the difference from the offset and get the right people to put those kinds of protections in place. Um, but, you know, it's also about things like knowing about platform policies too, you know, understanding what the platform platforms can and can't do what people are allowed to do in relation to that and also about you know, security precautions too as well right you know I, I mean I've heard I, I've heard tales of, of Chinese publishers for example there are lots of fantastic Chinese publishers who will help you get your game into the China market N you know nice and easily they know how to work all of the relevant channels but then there are also publishers who are working in the Chinese market who just see your game and pinch it and run off with it and go and make all the money off it in, in, in places like that. So, you know, it's about making sure that you take those necessary precautions. And your example with embargoes is another fantastic example of how exactly you can do that. Put in place some simple rules, know who you're messaging. And then if anything does happen, you can very, fairly easily trace something that's gone wrong. Um, but I think something that I want to sort of dive into as well, um, COVID challenges. So, you know, we've seen some specific challenges like we, you know, I think you're right to say in terms of game piracy, you know, it may, may not be the kind of thing that we've seen quite as much of in comparison to other types of content. But we have definitely seen games businesses being affected by things like phishing emails right at the moment. You know, there are sort of seem to be sort of a selection of fairly run of the mill, but potentially quite tricky to deal with scams out there. What kind of things have you seen going on? Yeah, sure. So uh, a phishing email is designed to um, convince the recipient that they've received an email from either someone they know or a reputable party and it asks them to take action, whether it be click on a link, open an attachment. So that's essentially why a phishing email is used uh, um, by the scammer to, first of all, verify that the account is um, active and then potentially, you know, get, get you to um, accept, you know, be duped by this mm. and then uh, um, either hijack your account or make you uh, make a payment. Um, why do scammers target games companies? Well, first of all, they're successful. So they're targeted companies that they believe are cash rich. And a lot of the scammers will go on to a company's house, look at the details, look at the financial records and say, right, I'll go after them. And due to the way company's house works, uh, it's going to have the CFO details on there and uh, all the other directors. And then usually they go onto your website and Lo and behold, everyone's name is listed there and everyone's email address is listed there. So, you know, point number one or step number one, don't put people's email addresses on the website and don't make them too obvious, you know, such as moatyuki.org.uk. But hey, it's OK. I know what those emails look like. <laughs> right. So 
once the email comes in, uh, what are they trying to do? Again, they're trying to convince, and we see many different variations on it, but sometimes they'll pretend to be in an internal email chain. So it'll go from, you know, someone in our accounts team um, to George saying, or the other way around saying, um, look, can you verify or authorize this payment? And then once someone responds to that email, they'll send either bank account details or a PayPal account details or um, asking for, you know, the person to make a payment transfer. So that's one type of, you know, phishing scam that we see, and that's obviously very financial orientated. Uh, we also see the type of emails that include a uh, hyperlink. It appears as though you know, yeah. download this attachment or you need to secure your login credentials and you'll be directed, uh, redirected to either a page to download the content or enter your login credentials. Um, here's, a, here's a quick one to try. Whenever you receive an email asking you to verify or reset your password, just type in a very silly phrase like, how is your uh, parents doing today, to put it kindly. Um, and usually if you press enter, there's no type of email verification or password verification. And therefore the, you know, the scammer who set that page up has not done a very good job. And that's usually a good way to tell um, that, you know, you're, someone's trying to scam you and obviously sends a, not rude, but not as well, a polite message to the scammer as well. I, I'll let you use your imagination on what type of message you want to send, um, send that person. It's obviously we're not past the watershed yet, so uh, and my kids might run in, so uh, uh, I better exactly. make sure I don't send anything too rude, you know. Um, so yeah, so obviously being aware. Now the main thing that I say to people is look at the actual email address, not the name of the person who sent the email. So the main scam is it will appear as though the email has come from accounts or George at UK. But when I check the email address, it's completely random and ambiguous. It's got nothing to do with George. So that is your main telltale sign of knowing that, hey, someone's trying to, you know, essentially scam me. Obviously, if it comes from, you know, especially with the current climate, it may appear as though it's come from Microsoft or Zoom or whoever else, et cetera. They'll use like the email signature, but the text won't match. So if you click, if you hover over any of the hyperlinks, you know, one of them will point to uh, a random website, whereas others will point to Microsoft.com or Zoom.us. So again, that's another way to tell. If they are pretending to be someone in your company or someone you work with, you know, we all have email signatures that include our details. Usually a scam email will have the name, potentially the email address, and that's it, and it'll be plain text. So these are all ways to identify these emails. The best thing to do is just ignore them. It's a bit like when you used to get people knocking on your door or the, the scam telephone calls. If you just lock them off and ignore them, eventually, Actually, they go away. So that's one thing. If you are the victim, straight away um, change your password and contact Action Fraud. If you don't file a report, it won't get recorded and law enforcement won't know what's going on and therefore they won't be able to take action. The main reason I say that, if there is a bank account or a PayPal account or any other um, payment platform that's being used, that email is going to probably hundreds or thousands of other people. The more people, um, sorry, the more uh, reports that are filed into law enforcement, the more likely that that account can be shut down and that obviously will stop other people being affected by this. And all right, if you're a victim, you know, it's happened. But let's make sure it doesn't happen to others. So that's something that we're seeing. And at the moment with the COVID, we're actually seeing more around, I say the COVID, like it's a thing, um, with COVID-19. What we are seeing is more the type of charity donation type emails being circulated. So here, click on this if you want to send the NHS PPE. So again, you click on the link, you think you're doing something good, and it's essentially a donation that's being made to a scammer rather than, you know, a official re uh, reputable charity. So just on that, just make sure if you do want to make any type of donation, whether it be, you know, to the NHS or any other charity, go to the official site, go make sure it's a reputable site. You know, these, com these companies will probably be emailing you anyway, so make sure you click on their link, don't click on a random email. So yeah. yeah, just be cautious on anything that comes into your inbox. Of course, and I, I think as well, this, this ties into something else we've been talking to in terms of the rest of the event, which, you know, with, with Tim Davis from Sheridan's, you know, we're talking about um, access to finance and the fact that you're actually able at this moment in time to get quite a lot of financial support from the government for your business. So there's that possibility that, um, you know, you 
reply in the wrong way or you get involved in one of these phishing emails funds that you may have gotten in from the government through the form of a loan or through something like that which is there to help your business could suddenly end up in the pocket of a scam basically at which point not only is your business potentially suffering because you've been having some problems with the covid crisis someone who's fishing in the middle of it could be taking the money that's actually helping out your business to get through it as well so it's a particularly important time to, to be careful but i i think you know that that kind of comes into the question about you know and i mean that's the shameless self-promotion bit i guess you know it's just like you obviously work hard with a lot of different businesses to actually stop these kinds of things and do as much as you can to prevent uh, ip infringement especially um at source but then also after the effect you know if something's happened you're there to, to help people out what are the kinds of services that you offer in in, in addition to the kind of free services because every uk member gets hold of the free services but there's some extra stuff as well you can offer to help out right yeah sure um so i'll just put my sales hat on and, um, you know, uh, we let out the, the, the big COVID sale that's taking place now. Um, the good news is a lot of what we do is included within the membership. You know, we try and include as much as possible to help our members. Obviously, there may be some services where we you know, have to cover some of our costings because additional resources are required. But again, you know, it's going to be, uh, quite frankly, cheaper than going to an external vendor. Um, just before I answer your question, the reason for we do that is because we we represent the UK or the world, actually, based on some of our members, games industry. We then have all of that data. So that then helps us go to platforms, go to government roundtables and even our policy team to say these are the issues um, that are affecting our industry. The example I'm going to give is um, football ticket sales. You are not allowed to sell. Uh, you know, football tickets to games outside the official market. It is against the law in the UK and Ireland, right? So when we touched about, you know, whether it be games and skins and, and, and et cetera, whether they should be, whether that should be illegal or not, doesn't matter. That's not for discussion. But the point being is, if we have the data and we can show there's one form of criminality, potentially there is a way to get legislation in. And the way you can do that is by having the data. So the more companies we work with, whether they be members or non-members, and again, just a, a side point, we do work with non-members as well. Um, we can then say, this is how big the issue is, this is what actually we can say. So I go back to answering your question. So yes, the way we can help our members. So yes, there is, if you want to call it, uh, traditional IP monitoring and takedown services, where if you give us your game titles um, and you tell us um, what platforms there are available, we can go on to nearly 200 websites and get the content taken down. Now, in a way, this is where it is good. Um, game files are pretty big. They're a few gigabytes, sometimes tens of gigabytes. So someone's got to spend a lot of time downloading that game. Now, we can usually uh, remove 70% of the links we find within 24 hours, sometimes quicker than that. So we can actually probably stop someone downloading a game. So can you imagine they get to that RAR or ZIP file, number 99 and too late, We've removed it and they've spent all that time in vain and they're not they can't complete the full compressed file and download the game. So it's a little bit of a disruption process that we do there. Um, overall, our takedown rate is about 80%. So a lot of what we find gets taken down. So that's that traditional area. We also help monitor the likes of the official um, and unofficial mobile app stores. So again, we can help find content on there. And we can either do the reporting for you or we could just offer you the platform if you want to do it. If you already have an in-house you know, legal team that just are you know, bored of doing those manual searches and using Excel to copy shortcut links, which we all did in the past, we can provide a platform for you. So we adapt that service. Likewise, we have UGC, user-generated content. If there is um, YouTube channels or Twitch channels or videos, et cetera, rather than you have to go on there, we have a web portal that can collect that information. And then again, you decide whether you want to do the takedown um, or you want Yuki to do it. Also, if you just want to know what's going on, if you are, again, to go back to that point about getting your content out there, you could use our service just to monitor and see how many views uh, videos are getting. You know, is someone getting more views than your official videos? Maybe that's someone that you want to work with. Do they have more subscribers? Again, it's a great way of knowing, you know, that's the good thing about, I hate to say, piracy data. It should be used as a marketing tool. Usually, if people want to download your content, whether it be or buy your content or steal your content, if it's popular, that means 
it's popular, both legal and illegal. So these services can be used for that as well. Where we get a little bit more bespoke and custom is where, again, some of our, you know, um, our members and the companies we work with are completely online. You know, it's a free to play environment. So we look at websites that are making gold or in-game items are available or set up private servers. So again, we can look at ways to, to take action against those type of services. Um, sometimes it's direct. We, are, we do not have a magic wand. We cannot shut everything down. But what we can do is at least attempt to contact those sites. And if it fails, and if there is a payment element, then we can look at the payment route. It's called the follow the money approach. And that's what we try to do. So we see where uh, and how um, the site owners are making money. And is there a way for us to take action against that? So there are some payment service and credit card services that we work with. And usually, if we can terminate those services, that will stop the likes of George and Mo going onto a site and using their credit card to make a payment. You know, because usually if you remove the major pl uh, payment platforms, the only alternative means are some kind of web money transfer. We may have to go to your news agent and queue for a voucher or something like that. And no one really trusts, you know, those kind of platforms. So again, you don't want to do that. And just on a side note, many, many years ago for a, a, di a different company I worked for, well, we actually had a covert credit card and we used that covert co credit card to make payments and um, a few months later we, we found that someone had booked um, flights to Riga using our credit card um, via EasyJet so that's another thing you know going onto these sites you are giving your credit card details your home details personal details to the bad guys so think what they're going to do with it you know just keep that in mind as well yeah so um, but yeah yeah so overall we can help um, you know, cover all the various different platforms. And like I say, if there is a specific issue, we will try and tailor the service to help our member the most. Fantastic. Well, Mo, I mean, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, one final question. If anyone wants to get in touch with you, I think you already gave away your contact information, but what's the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah, sure. It's as simple as mo, mo at uk, And obviously feel free to direct um, email me directly and I'll be more than happy to help. There we go. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Mike. And remember, if you need to hear more from us at Yuki, uh, you can go to at UK underscore IE on Twitter, and that's where we're living. We're also on Facebook and we're on YouTube and LinkedIn as well. Uh, you can head to our website, access our weekly newsletter too. Head to the newsletter section. You should be able to get in through there. And if you want to follow what I'm up to as well, I'm at George Osborne. Yes, I really am. Um, and you can also email me, George at Yuki.org. Dot uk too uh, and that's about it for now thank you so much for your time mo and i hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day